Welcome to season three of Overcoming Working Mum Burnout. I'm your host, Dr. Jacqueline Kerr, mum, behavior scientist, and burnout survivor. I interview DEI leadership and mental health experts to uncover burnout solutions at the individual, family, work, and cultural levels. When mums thrive, the world benefits. Please take a moment to check out my website at drjacquelinecurr.com. Click on the free guides button and find solutions for burnout that support individual team and organizational change. If you're worried about regrettable turnover and quiet quitting, but already have too much on your plate, I can provide a comprehensive roadmap to help you improve wellness, belonging, and engagement through an overarching burnout prevention strategy. So you can have thriving, diverse leadership teams. Eve Rodsky is the author of Fair Play and Unicorn Space. The documentary Fair Play also outlines her journey as an activist for equality. Valuing your time and having your time valued by others is such an important part of burnout prevention, because when we give our time away for free, we are left feeling depleted and unappreciated. Her books provide tools to one, start a new conversation about time in the home, and how to value all time equally. And two, how as a mother, you can make yourself unavailable to your family to spend time creating something meaningful for yourself and others, guilt-free. I hope you learn as much from this conversation as I did. My name is Eve Rodsky. I'm the author of the New York Times bestselling book, Fair Play, and a new book out called Find Your Unicorn Space. I live in Los Angeles with my hetero cisgender husband and our three kids, Zach, who's 13, Ben, who's 10, and Anna, who is five. Great. Thank you so much for that. Could you start to tell us a little more about where you are now in your career and the journey that you have taken to get there? Because a lot of times moms have had changes in their careers, either due to motherhood, due to burnout or other reasons due to wanting a new focus. So I know you've been through a lot. So please tell us how you got to where you are now. Yes. Well, we now know that the majority of women take a career detour, especially after having kids. So thank you for your work in normalizing that. The world is not set up for a linear career for women, nor should it be. And the same thing happened to me. A lot of the pivots I took that actually I thought were my choice, Jacqueline, were actually forced decisions based on, I think, systemic inequity and sexism. But for me, I'll just say I did not picture myself being a gendered division of labor expert that wasn't on my third grade. What do you want to be when you grow up board? I think it probably said like veterinarian there or something. Definitely not what I'm doing today, but this really came about 10 years ago. Most of us come to this from our own personal experiences where there's a point where we realize that this whole lie of girls ruling the world, women being able to do anything um, the same as men, where that lie just becomes unsustainable and you can't live it anymore. So either it forces you out of the workforce, it forces you into an unequal marriage, it forces you into, as my one friend said, court ordered custody because of the resentment and rage of that unequal marriage. So something usually happens where we realize this lie that we've been sold, that we've been sold a bill of goods. But you started out in the legal profession and you now have turned and are working as an author, but you do so much more in terms of a bigger mission and your work with the Equity Lounge. Along the way, you've developed all these skills that can help you. I think that's part of the challenging side you've outlined. But the positive side is along the way, you're constantly learning and growing. Oh my God. Yes. I think there's never a skill wasted. And for me, the work that I've done, I started off in mergers and acquisitions in a law firm. I always value justice, but the reality of, you know, American schooling is that you end up with half a million dollars of debt, which is what I had after college and law school. So I started to pay off that debt at a major law firm and working in M&A, understanding the detail orientation, what it looks like to be in a man's world, and then moving over to tax exempt organizations and using my legal background and mediation background to start to design organizations for families. That's my background. I work for families that look like the HBO show Succession, and you should feel bad for me. But 
what I do for those families is I do create grace and humor and generosity around the most complex organizational and financial decisions for those families. And I did start my own firm because I was doing this work at a fortune 500 company. And due to the death by a thousand cuts after my maternity leave, where I'd asked for Friday off, uh, not even off. I asked for Fridays to work at home. And my direct manager said, I can't give you that because that's my arrangement. And I don't want the powers that be to know that I do that. So not blaming her, but understanding that there's no psychological safety to even ask to work from home for one day to understand that we had an open floor office plan and one giant bathroom and there was no lactation space. There wasn't even a closet. So for the first return to work, I was sitting in a dark stairwell. I was pumping in a stairwell that people don't even believe it, but that's our reality is until they could figure out a place for lactation. It's the skills stay with you, but so do the scars. And I will say that having a community or a coach like you or having a community, I wish I had your framework and understanding that this was not me, that I didn't have to blame myself. And so I, again, I thank you for the work you're doing because everything I do is as the ghost of Christmas future so that the people around me feel like it's never too late and the people behind me understand what they're up against and to normalize it so they never blame themselves. And that is so valuable. And some days I feel like, what am I doing complaining about my life? I've had so many opportunities, but I think normalizing these challenges and in the way you have as well, adding some of the research data to them, getting as many different perspectives in there is so important so that people can see themselves and see that it's not them to blame. But I do think this is one thing I'm encountering that I think is really interesting. As soon as you start to talk about the systems and the disadvantages we're facing, some people's reaction to that is to feel like they don't want to hear that. They don't want to hear that they're a victim. They want to hear that they have more control and that their hard work will get them to succeed. And I do believe it does. I think you do succeed and you do get to the table. But then once you get there, it's a whole other battle and you're exhausted. So I agree in terms of you saying we have to understand this lie. But I think many women still don't want to believe it. Yeah. Look, there's a delicate dance, right? And I talk about this a lot. This is in my policy work. There's a delicate dance between saying systemic issues are keeping you down and understanding your individual agency within those systems. So the way I like to think about it is a metaphor. We can acknowledge that we're breathing polluted air, but we still have to breathe. Just because I'm breathing polluted air, I'm not going to say I'm not going to breathe. I'm waiting for clean air. If you do that, then you're going to suffocate. You're going to die. So I think that you can acknowledge that you're breathing polluted air, that things are harder and they are systemic while also taking agency in your own life. And that's the whole point of fair play and find your unicorn space. There are books that say you are going to take agency in your own life amidst these systemic inequities, because why wouldn't you, why wouldn't you say that you can have a fulfilled, amazing life where you can be unavailable from your roles when you take those scary steps to assert yourself and say, I'm going to be maybe the first in my relationship or the first in my family or the first in my community to say, my partner picks up our kids from school when they're sick. Um, I deserve a permission to be unavailable. I spend Sundays alone writing or painting, and I do not take care of my families or my family. These things on an individual level have serious political power because private lives are public issues. Exactly. I think that's such a great way of framing it. And I really like your analogy there too. So let's get into the book since you mentioned them, and then we'll come back to your broader role and your thoughts about the playbook for policy change as well. Let's first start with Fair Play, which for me was a game changer in many different ways, in some ways, because it really did put up my marriage on rocky ground. And I know you talk about some of those stories in your book, but also in the Unicorn Space book, you follow up with some of these stories, which I loved. I loved hearing in Unicorn Space about the other challenges women had in acting fair play. So that was just such a lovely transition between those books. And in my experience, I really struggled. You have such great advice on how to get started with this and how to approach your partner carefully and thoughtfully, etc. And despite that, <laughs> I 
I still messed up that intro. My husband never got on board with this concept of the cards and the doing things. He wanted to do things, more things together. And later I understood that was his love language, was quality time together. So I was asking him to do something that didn't match, that he felt then I was also going to be judgmental about. But what it really freed me to do is say, actually, I don't need my husband's help in the home when I'm doing these things. What I need is a break entirely from everyone very frequently. So I think it changed the story. It changed our conversation, even though I didn't get to allocating the cards differently. In fact, I ended up taking on picking up dog poo as an extra card and I was devastated. It put me at this low point, but in the end, it was the gateway to changing our relationship. And for me, knowing to ask for what I need and also what I need is a break. I actually don't need more help in the moment. I just need total time away. And actually, I wanted to share with you how often I recommend people to use Fair Play. And even I recently did a TEDx talk, and it was one of the things I had to cut so many recommendations, but it was one of the things I kept in because I thought it was so important that mums and families, partners get the chance to use these this concept to start a new conversation. And that's it, by the way. That is the whole point. The whole point is that and this is what my mother has said to me. She's a professor of social justice. She's a professor of social work. She's a professor of community change. She understands per- people in their environment. And what her point is, and what she's been teaching for in coalition building and change for 50 years, is that qu- questions are more powerful than answers. And so when you start to say, why am I so resentful that I'm holding all these cards, right? Maybe it is because I really am sick of wiping asses and doing dishes. Other times it could be I'm losing my identity and I don't have any time off, like you said. However you come to this work, the questions are gonna change your life, whether or not you implement the system. And that's the beauty of a lot of women ended up starting and saying to me that they started, because fair play, we introduced the concept of unicorn space, right? This active, like you said, this break of the mind, the active attention, paying attention to things you love, whether it's your podcast, whether it's a robotic, making robotic cakes as one of my friends does. She uses motors in her cakes that makes them move. Whatever these active pursuits are that make you, you, the return to them, to the curiosity, the connection, and that completion of a unicorn space cycle, like this podcast, you're curious about a guest whether or not you end up using their system, but it changes something in your life and you have to see things differently. Then you connect with that person. And then you do the hard thing of completing the episode and uploading it, whether one person listens or a billion, it's scary and you do it. That cycle is often the beginning of impetus to fair play. So some people need fair play to get to their unicorn space. Other people need their unicorn space and their reason to have that break and that sustained attention for themselves to ultimately get to a version of fair play for them. And that's why these books are sisters, they're companions, because you will get to this work eventually if you hear these ideas. It just doesn't have to be in one way. This is not self-help. This is a book about mutual aid and what communities around you do you want to support yourself with so you have this permission to be unavailable from your roles. And I love this idea that they're sisters because you even talk about that in Unicorn Space in terms of your process of saying this is going to be a series of books and that helped free you from your perfectionism (laughs) of your first book. But they are, they're really reinforcing. And when you say that now more deliberately and thinking about the sisters of the book, they really are. They're so helpful together. But I actually think the fair play system was genius because to be able to have a conversation that had something substantial in your hands to talk about it's so hard to have these conversations whereas the cards with everybody's different roles changed that entirely and in fact I have an interview that I did with a marriage and family therapist and she actually does a similar task with all her families to help them all take on roles But the cards were just such a game changer from that perspective of one, outlining everything you do and having that more present in front of you and realizing how much you do, but also then it facilitating the conversation. So I do think that is such an important part of it. So going through that process is definitely part of it. 
but also now you have fair play facilitators. And I think that is also so important because implementing these systems and these ways of doing things is challenging. So tell us a bit more about how you came to that solution and what those facilitators are doing. That's for exactly your point that because we're not trained as women to ask for what we need, we've been conditioned since birth to be seen and not heard in many ways, right? The idea of a woman being loud and wrong is pretty subversive, right? As a woman, I will say, I'm allowed to be loud and right. I'm allowed to be quiet and wrong, but loud and wrong is not easy. So we're not really trained or conditioned to use our voice to ask for what we need. So often what happens is that we end up in a rage and resentment cycle where it is hard and you do need an external third party to call a timeout. And oftentimes what we were seeing in therapy were people who didn't understand the gender lens were saying things like, we don't really want to be having a conversation about garbage here, your love language or your relationship or your connection. But what I kept saying was no, but if Seth doesn't take the garbage out, our connection is is over. (laughs) Like I'm out of this marriage. So it was a lot of times where we were hearing from people who were implementing fair play that they were doing almost better on their own. And that was scary to me. We want facilitators, coaches to understand, therapists to understand the gender lens. And so many do. And so we started with a cohort of people who were already using it. And now we're at 75 people across the US of the highest caliber coaches and therapists who include fair play, the systemic intervention, we call it systemic decision-making into their practice, which is so exciting because we're entering a no excuse zone. And that's really the truth, whether it's the apps out there like Asana or Evernote or a fair play, there's really no excuses right now anymore in the 21st century for allowing assumptions of gender to decide and dictate who does what in the home. I think that's so important that you call that out. And I feel like that coming from the behavior sciences that I do, and I've been doing this research on burnout, and there are so many solutions there. There are so many fantastic recommendations from the National Academy of Medicine. There are research-based solutions in workplaces. There are fantastic diversity and equity guidelines, playbooks, Really, we have no excuse to say we don't know what to do, because I think we do. We do know what to do. Exactly. It's just a no excuse zone. Exactly. I feel that way about burnout. I feel that way about gender division of labor in the home. There's just no excuse. You know what to do. And that's the thing about fair play. It's researched. We are now getting a peer reviewed research project on it. We have thousands of data points. We probably have the biggest longitudinal study of unpaid labor that's ever been done. We know what to do. Structured decision-making is the end of bias. And that's the whole idea of behavioral sciences. For me as a lawyer, I look at law as a behavioral science because people say they want to design their life. I said, I love that. But the only way you're really designing your life in society is if you want to have people keep your kids safe and stop at a stop sign, you're going to pass a law, right? If you want people not to vote in Georgia, you're going to pass a law. So Lawyers, we're always looking at how society is designed based on how we do governance and legislating. This is basically legislating for the home. It's deciding what governance, what laws, what decision-making you want to do in advance of the decision. I remember one man said to me, well, my home, we just wait to decide who's taking the dog out right when it's about to take a piss on the rug. And I said, fair play is that, but the exact opposite. Whatever you're doing in your home, I just want people to do the exact opposite of that. And that's what the whole concept you're coming to as well from that legal perspective that I love. But it is that concept of prevention. Let's not get to the point where you have to do this emergency decision versus saying, hey, we know in advance these things are happening. We're aware of them. What do we do in advance? And that's a public health side. So I see, I love that. Yeah, because decision Decision fatigue is so important. We know that in our medical system. That's why checklists have become such key tools for physicians. And that's essentially the fair play cards are a form of checklist on steroids. That's all it is a structured decision making tool that came out of 50 years of understanding how structured decision making ends bias. And you can read Jess Nordell's book, The End of Bias, if you don't believe me. What I just keep saying is that this is a structured decision making tool 
for the end of decision fatigue. And I'm listening to Jess's book at the moment. I've almost finished it and I absolutely love it. I love all her examples. I watched her on one of your interviews and then downloaded the book. And I want to go in so many directions because I want to talk more policy, but just even thinking about listening to her book. Can I tell you, when you shared the story of being nervous about doing the audio version of Fair Play, and I loved listening to Unicorn Space because every time you said the word, I could hear the joy in your voice. It was so wonderful to listen to from that perspective. So again, I love that you shared some of your doubts and some of your processes, but I also love the joy that you brought to this concept. But tell us a little bit more about Unicorn Space and again, what has been some of the biggest challenges with this concept? Because I really feel like in the book, you are having to address those challenges ahead of time in some ways. Yeah, I wish that I could have just gotten to the idea of just what a unicorn space is, as we said earlier, which was the curiosity, connection, and completion cycle. This is not a how to be happy book at all. This is understanding that it rains a lot. And if we look at our lives as just, we want to be happy, we're really missing the point. What this book addresses is that the appropriate definition of mental health, if you ask many who are more well-versed in mental health than I am, an appropriate version of mental health is to have the appropriate emotion at the appropriate time and the ability and strength to weather it. And so when you think about unicorn space, do we want to have an umbrella for the rain, that, that ability and strength to weather it, or do we want to just drown? And so many of us are drowning because we don't give ourselves that umbrella. We don't give ourselves that space, as you said, to just be with ourselves, be in active pursuits. We give ourselves space to stay small and diet, maybe to exercise, maybe to dye our hair, things that are in service of other people. But when do we get a chance to just have uninterrupted attention for something we love? to do. So many of us in my research in 17 countries said, that doesn't even make sense to me, Eve, because availability, being available is my identity. What do you mean I'd have my phone off? What do you mean I wouldn't pick up if the kid's school calls? It's become so part of our identity to give away our time, our most valuable currency to others for free, that we do it with almost a pride instead of understanding that it's an emergency that we stop. And that's really what Unicorn Space is about. It's a book about learning to dance in the rain, having an umbrella with having these Unicorn Space moments that shield us. And that is why I did take pride in reading the audio book for Fair Play. I was super scared. It was not a Unicorn Space moment for me, but for being in that booth, that flow state of reading Unicorn Space, it was. I was completely unavailable. I was in a sound booth with no phones reading these words that I loved that were other people's words that I got to interview and understand that it was the culmination. It was the completion of my journey of that journey of being curious about why women didn't believe they have a permission to be unavailable from their roles. I can help you tell you what it is, but I can help you get there. And that was the beauty of this moment. That is the joy of this book. It's an understanding that we deserve a permission to be unavailable from our roles. We deserve to vanquish guilt and shame. We deserve to ask for what we need. And then when you're there, when you vanquish those hurdles, you can arrive at a place of curiosity, connection, and completion that is so beautiful. It fills us up. It becomes our umbrella. And I love that umbrella analogy because I agree. I think it's really important to admit that there are up and down days. And if it is a rainy day, what is your umbrella? What have you done to fill up your cup to help you get through those times? But I also think I'm glad you came back to that issue of time because that was another game changer that came to me through fair play. Simply your argument. And of course, people have got to realize like, Eve has this legal background. She's so damn good at making an argument. They are watertight arguments. Oh my goodness. And I love it because I just love seeing that progress. But the argument you make about how do we value our time that it doesn't matter what we get paid per hour because often there is that disparity between mums and dads it's not about that it's is our hour of time equally valuable as that other person's hour of time to us and to them and that had never just that had never occurred to me and that was so empowering for me to each time say it's not about what I get paid it's about that time being important 
Yes. And it's about all time is created equal, right? We just get 24 hours in a day. And so what's happened is the through line of fair play and unicorn space is this fundamental understanding that who does it benefit? Who benefits when women give away their time for free, our most valuable currency? And what I realize is that it doesn't benefit us. What benefits society is to convince women that our time is worthless because then we'll use it in service of others, which is basically the social safety net of America. And so what I realized what was so dangerous about convincing people that time is money, as opposed to that we just get the same amount of hours in a lifetime as our male counterparts, it has women making decisions about their time that I don't believe serves them. And so what I mean by that is for me, when Fair Play talks about my journey back to myself through having a really hard time in my marriage that we got through. And it starts with a blueberries breakdown. My husband's sending me a text. I'm surprised you didn't get blueberries. And it ends with an understanding where I said to Seth, look, this is not about money. It's not about who does what, or it's not scorekeeping. This is a fundamental understanding that you get four hours after our kids go to bed at night to watch sports center, decompress from your long day, literally have your share of mind back for the things that you love. Whereas I'm doing things in service of our home till my head hits the pillow, which is two hours after not only am I losing two hours sleep, but my entire share of mind is focused on things that I didn't choose to do that have been thrust upon me. And I deserve Seth equal time choice over how I use my day as you do. I didn't say this to Seth, but maybe that means, right? He's going to have less time choice over his day. Well, I get more, but it's not, it doesn't become a zero sum game like that because what happens is the more you do structured decision-making and preventative medicine for decision fatigue, the more you both have time. And that's why so many men are on board because they're like, my life is so much fucking better now because I know my role. I know what I'm responsible for. We check in when we're having high cognition, low emotion conversation. It's a system. It's not a list. And that's ultimately how things start to change for these thousands and thousands of couples. And it doesn't have to be that everybody uses the system in the same way. It has to be just an understanding that your time is valuable. That understanding alone changes every single relationship when it is reported back to me, every single one. It's such an important mindset shift. And I think one of the things that I notice now too, as well, my husband and I have had to work on this so much is saying thank you to each other for whatever we do. But now my husband thanks me for the time that he does get away. He had that time before, but he never valued that it was time away that he got and that I didn't necessarily get at the time. And so that shift now. So now when he does have his mountain bike evenings, he's thanks for giving me the time to do this. And by the way, that's important about gratitude. People always ask me why I don't build in gratitude into the system. And because I did not see that in my research, I never saw when I would build gratitude into the system, men would say to me, I'm not going to thank my wife for doing the dishes. I work hard all day. And then women would say to me, this is more of a traditional gender role. I'm not going to thank my husband for babysitting our kids. That's all I do. It's nightmare work. And I'm the reason why he can have paid work. It was this very tit for tat. People were too resentful to (laughs) add gratitude as an input into the system. But what I realized is gratitude is an output of the system. It's an output of recognizing that all time is created equal. Then all of a sudden you say, wait a second, this person's hour is important. And I see their invisible work. I see what they're doing. I say that to Seth all the time. And we make fun of each other now. Like if I'm up doing something and Seth is watching a game, he's like, I see you, Eve. I see your invisible work. And I do the same for him when he's commuting our kids to 17 basketball practices. And then I was away with my son camping and my older son, this happened twice in a row, two weekends I've been away. My older son got hives, completely got sick the whole weekend. This weekend he's vomiting everywhere. Seth has Lysol on, cleaning up vomit. I'm like, I see your invisible work. So gratitude and humor come out of the system when you start to recognize that when you value an hour of your partner's time, It's so beautiful because 
you get it back in spades because then they start to value your time. Right. And that's exactly it. You're valuing their time equally and your own time equally. And for me, it was this moment, actually, it was my breaking moment was when I couldn't thank my husband for taking my daughter to the pediatrician one time. And that started my whole downfall because we had such a bad fight and I just went into a really dark space after that. And that was when I started to realize what is going wrong here in our life, in my life, my work life. And eventually came out the other side of leaving my job and realizing what I had been going through is burnout. But it was almost like that point where I was like, I can't believe I can't thank him. And I can't believe that I'm in this situation. So, you know, um, positive affirmations. I discovered in this process as well is my love language. So part of that has been like trying to help my husband say those things to me, but we both do it now and it just feels so much better. So I'm so grateful for the journey at the end of the day. And it's a journey. It's a journey. And there's going to be times again, where the, he takes in the pediatrician and asks you like what time and you're going to be like, I'm going to stab you in the eye with a pen again. So the point is that this is a practice and I think that this is the hardest thing and the most important thing to remember is that it's like saying don't eat sugar, which I get in theory, but it's never going to happen in my life. It's that communication, it was so interesting because I asked in surveys, what is your most important practice? And I did it very vaguely because I wanted to get to this interesting data, which is that not one person out of a thousand people I surveyed on, so online said communication was their most important practice. Most people said some version of exercise, which is fine, but this is the truth. The truth is that people look at communication, the opposite of a practice, which is highly dangerous. So people were saying to me, I communicate to get my husband to get him the information about where to go for the pediatrician, or I'm communicating with my kid to remind them to charge their phone, or I communicate with my boss because we have to work on this project. Not one person ever says to me, I communicate with my partner to get better at communicating with my partner. That's what I'm looking for. The same way that if I said to you, I'm your doctor and I sit down for a preventative checkup and I say, are you physically fit? And you say to me in 2004, I ran one day. That piece of information is how people look at communication. I ran one day in 2004 and I should be fit for life. People will say to me, I had that conversation with my partner. It didn't work. And that's it. They'll never go back to the table again. So it, it makes no sense, right? It doesn't make any sense because communication is the same as exercise. They practice. If you don't go back to the table, if you don't run yesterday, it doesn't mean you're never going to run again. It means you get back on that treadmill today. And that's the most important lesson I'm hoping that people will get out of this day together is that if you could start thinking about communication as a practice, checking in when you want to have high cognition, low emotion conversations, do it every Sunday night or every Friday night, or having that lunch a week, starting that practice of checking in every single week will make it much easier to start these conversations about the unfairness of the domestic load. And I think there are also key times of year where you really need to put those into operation differently. The summer vacation is a time where I end up taking on all the organization and I come out of that completely depleted. So I need to cue myself beforehand to structure it differently, to have those conversations differently and know that somehow that is my Achilles heel each year. There are certain times when we need to think more proactively. Absolutely. And that's the beauty of the cards. The goal is to redeal, right? It's not to have any fixed system. It's to say, I'm not going to be the pediatrician holder, medical scheduler forever. It means that I could do that this year and you can do it next year. It means that we can change tomorrow. It can mean that the way Seth and I do it now is bi-weekly. We decide, okay, if there's a problem at school, someone gets sick, there's an interruption. This is your week. This is your interruption week. I have interruption week next week. And so if it happens on our dime or on our time, it is what it is. You can do it as a kid split. You plan summer for one child, the other person plans summer for the other child. It has to be dynamic. It can always get better. And the more you start practicing, the better it will get. And with any skill and any behavior change, practice is so key. So I'm so glad you're focusing on that. 
But I'd love to go back to where we started, which was this bigger mission you have around gender equity and diversity. What have you learned as an advocate? Because as I say, you have already have so many skills and such an amazing perspective, but you also must have learned so much about this in the last few years. And so what do you feel are the most important things that you're learning to do differently at a policy level, at a systems change around these broader topics? And what would you suggest for others? Like how can other people become advocates and leaders like you've become? Thank you. I think the most important thing I would say is that it doesn't happen overnight. And the most empowering thing to remember is that private lives are public issues. And so the more you can do in your community to model a fair life, to model that you care about an hour in the pediatrician's office as much as an hour in the boardroom, things will start to change. And that's why advocacy doesn't have to be so hard. For me, it was just one question, right? We all can ask questions back to the power of questions. What would this world look like if we treated our homes as our most important organizations? I do organizational management for a living. And so this idea that, wow, we don't look at our homes as organizations. We don't look at them as places to invest in, to empower ourselves and to learn about, to research. And that question then got me to the second most important question I'd ever asked, which is how did mustard get in your refrigerator? And from asking that question in 17 countries, I got an understanding of how this idea of the both trap, as we talked about, this idea that we have to do things together was actually the thing that was making our marriages and our homes fall apart. Because what happens is if you both handle groceries, what was really happening was that, especially in hetero cisgender relationships, women were the ones noticing their second son, Johnny, likes yellow mustard with his protein, otherwise he chokes. They were the ones monitoring the mustard and getting stakeholder buy-in from their family for what they need for the list. And then their partners were going to them to the store to pick up the yellow mustard and they're bringing home spicy Dijon every freaking time. And then people are saying to me, they can't even bring home the right type of mustard, Eve. How can I trust my partner with my living will? And so this breakdown of the conception and planning and execution between two partners, I was able to pinpoint it and say, this is the downfall of accountability and trust in a relationship. And when you bring back the ownership mindset into a home, you can eliminate the erosion of accountability and trust. And that became the basis of testing my thesis over 10 years. And that's ultimately how I came up with Fair Play and how it became a book, but it never started that way. It started with one question. How did mustard get in your refrigerator? So what then is the question you're asking in that broader society, in all the work that you're doing with the Equity Lounge, all the speakers and authors and the conversations you're having that people can follow and see online? I don't know how many times a week you're you're out there doing these things, but you're really investing a lot of time in that as well. So what is the question that you're asking there and what is the question that people should be asking. What I'm asking right now is how do we really put into practice that all time is created equal? And to put that into practice, we need a couple of things. We need fair pay, fair play, and fair day. And what I mean by that is for an hour in the pediatrician's office really to be as valuable as an hour in the boardroom, we have to really invite men into their full power in the home so that women can step out into their full power in the world. And so the question I'm asking is, what are the barriers to men for valuing and doing unpaid labor? And there are a lot of barriers to men, this toxic masculinity idea that men have to be the only breadwinners being defined by money. There's a lot of different issues that are holding us back. We also, as a society have traditionally thought of unpaid care as free. We say things like breastfeeding is free when it's really an 1800 hour a year job. We have occupational segregation where women, when they enter male professions, salaries automatically go down. So there are lots of areas in our country, in America, where we are telling women their time is less valuable than men's time. And then the hardest part is when women start internalizing it. And so I'm fighting really hard for women first and foremost to assert that their time is equal. And that means never saying to themselves again, I do more unpaid labor in the home because my partner makes more money than me. It means never saying, 
I'm a better multitasker. I'm wired differently for care. It means never saying in the time it takes me to tell him, her, they, what to do, I should do it myself. It's never saying I can find the time because those are all toxic time messages that I want to erase from women's vocabulary so that they can start understanding that we can value our own time. And then that leads to reverberations out in a way that when we take agency in our own life, that it leads to these bigger systemic issues being righted, these wrongs being righted. So that's what I'm really working on. I'm working on fair pay, fair play, and fair day. Fair play is what we've been talking about this whole time about time. Fair day is understanding that we should value caregiving in the workplace and not hide it. And then fair pay, of course, is paying women equitably for the same amount of hours in the workplace. That's such a fantastic message for people to to think about. And so well said as well. So eloquently put together, we need these terms to help us be able to focus because sometimes it does seem overwhelming. How do we change a system? How do we change the world? That's it. Pick one. You can focus on fair play. You can focus on fair day. You can focus on fair pay. Those are three places. Pick one, stick a toe in the water, get curious. And that's a great way to join the movement. Thanks so much for listening today. Don't forget to check out my website, www.drjacquelinecurr.com for your free guides to prevent burnout. And please remember, burnout can be related to serious health problems. If you're experiencing physical or mental health symptoms, please contact a health provider or call the appropriate helpline. This podcast does not replace medical advice. Take care. Control your affairs.